Welcome to the Volleyball Rules presentation for the upcoming intramural sports season here at Florida State University. I'm Director of Intramural Sports, David Peters. We're going to walk you through how you need to be ready to play this season in our volleyball uh, league, including facility information. We'll start off with where to play and then how you will get checked in. We'll follow that up with a quick summary of our volleyball rules. Most people know how to play the regular game of volleyball, but we'll talk about a few changes we have here in intramural sports. And then we'll f finish out with some league information to make sure that your team is ready to go and arriving at the right spot and at the right time to play in its matches this season. Everything we do here in Intramural Sports is based off of our seven principles of Intramural Sports. So you'll see some things with regards to safety and involvement and participation and also sportsmanship. Those are all keys to making sure that you have a good experience in our program. All right, let's talk first of all with where to go. Volleyball is played in Tully Gymnasium, which is located right next door to the Leach Center. And when you come over, make sure that no alcohol, no tobacco is part of your uh, stash of things bringing in. We don't allow that, nor do we allow pets in Tully Gym. So leave your pet dog or cat or fish at the house. No food or flavored drinks are allowed on the gym floor, but if you bring your dinner, you can eat in the lobby. Just don't bring it onto the court surface. We do allow bottled water inside the gym, just in case you need to hydrate, and we have plenty of water fountains in the building as well. Now, you want to make sure you also bring your FSU card when you come. Your current valid FSU card is what you need to check in. And you check in in the lobby area of Tele Gymnasium, so bring it on about 10 or 15 minutes before your scheduled start time of your match. You'll check in, you'll sign our waiver, and you'll be ready to play. It's as easy as that. But make sure you do that by checking in there at the table. We don't sign you in at the court, so you'll stop at the check-in table first in the lobby, and then you make your way on in to get ready for your match at courtside. Now remember that all of our participants can only play on one team in a particular league. So you can play on only one men's team or one women's team, and then you can play on a co-rec team. So in volleyball, you get two teams as long as one of those is co-rec. An additional reminder that once you sign in for a team, you're not allowed to change teams for the rest of the season. So be sure on that first day when you sign in for the team, if that's the team you want to play for all year long. Hey, captain's responsibilities are very important to us, so if you're the team captain, make sure you pay attention to this session. You also want to get more information about player eligibility, about restricted players, our forgotten ID pass, forfeits, defaults, and some fines related to those things, and also our regular season and playoff formats. All of that's available on our website. You can get some more information, or also view our team captain's podcast. It's available separately. Sportsmanship is our number one priority in intramural sports and in volleyball in particular as well. So make sure you come out and respect your opponents and respect the game officials. We want everyone having a good time and that means making sure that the game atmosphere is good natured. So we do rate all of our teams on a scale of 0 to 4. You need a 3.0 average to make it to our playoffs. So just remember that sportsmanship does matter. For more information about sportsmanship, we have another podcast separately that you can watch or you can also visit our website for sportsmanship guidelines. All right, let's get into volleyball season now. And volleyball here in Intramurals is six on six. So in our men's, women's, fraternity, and sorority league, you just need six players. You can play with four. You can also play with five players. In co-rec, it's a split between the genders. You need at least two males and at least two females out there to play. And you can have three of each. So most of the time, our teams come with three males and three females ready to go on the court. You're welcome to have more people on your team. It'll be substitutes. But three and three is what we will play with in co-rec. You can also play with five players. That's two males and three females or three males and two females, or two and two. Those are the legal combinations in our co-rec league. Again, four players are required to start. If you play with four, you only get two front row players. And we'll talk about front row and back row in just a little bit. Three players are to be there gets you a free default. Having two or less is going to be a costly forfeit. So make sure that you know when your team's playing and you get there on time with the right amount of players. Now, when you're playing volleyball, jewelry is not allowed to be worn by any of our participants, so please take that off. That includes rings, watches, necklaces, earrings, just anything that shines when we take a look at it. And also, if it doesn't shine, like a Livestrong bracelet, that needs to come off as well. We're thinking about your safety, and so we make sure you take those off before the game. Also, have to have proper shoes. Now, sandals and flip-flops are no good. You can't play barefoot, and boots and cleats, of course, not allowed in our gym surface. So just a regular pair of uh, tennis shoes or basketball shoes, some sort of uh, regular sports shoes will be appropriate, and you'll want to make sure you have those on. We always encourage additional personal safety equipment, so if you're thinking about knee pads or elbow pads, those will be legal, because we want you to be safe, although most of our activities in volleyball aren't that intense, but again, personal safety is always a top concern for us, and we would encourage you to consider other things that keep you safe. Our match format in volleyball is best two of three games. The first and the second games are to 30 points, but note that there's a 32-point cap on those games, which means if we get to a point where it's 31-31, because you have to win by two, so 30 to 28 would be okay, but if it's 31 to 31, then the next point is going to win that game. It won't be a two-point win. It's just 32 to 31 in those first two games. In the last game, if we go to that third game, it's a 15-point game, but you have to win by two, so that game can play all the way up to 42-40, for example. But uh, only to 15 is what we would say there in the third game of our match. Most matches take about 45, 50 minutes to play, so you have enough time to get a few minutes of warm-up, 
and then get all three games in if it goes that far within about an hour. Now notice that in our game, we use rally scoring. So a point is served, or excuse me, scored on every service that occurs. So if you serve and score a point, that is for your team. If the opponent serves and you win the point, then that also scores a point. We don't have side outs as you may play in some other sports. So every serve is going to score a point for one team or the other. Note that each team does receive two timeouts per game, and timeouts are just 30 seconds in, league, in length. You can take them consecutively if you want for a longer break. They don't carry over, so if you don't use your timeouts in game one, uh, they don't come over to game number two. Rotation and substitute is a key part to volleyball because you're going to rotate along the back row and along the front row each time. But we have a particular role here in intramurals with substitutes. It helps keep things pretty easy. First of all, the rotation, usually as you can see along the back, is server, and then you move along the back row and then up to the front and across the front row, and that'll be your substitution. Uh, again, rotating every time you're about to serve. And notice when the sub can occur. You can bring in one sub only prior to the serve. So if you're about to step back to the server position, you want to bring in someone off the bench, you can do that, but that's the only time. We do not do person-for-person -person subs, so you won't be able to sub off the front row and then uh, in the middle of the game off the back row, only again right here, right before the serve. So they'll step in and serve, and then the substitute must play a complete rotation before subbing out. So uh, it's the whole way around. You can see that right here, that uh, the server uh, may serve the ball from anywhere along the back line, and it must be in between the sidelines. And the serve can touch the net in our league and go over, and it is then playable by the opponent. So serve to touch the net are okay, and you can serve anywhere along that back line. But again, in the rotational scheme, once you serve, you have to continue to play the back row and the front row, unless there's some sort of injury, and we certainly take that into account. Now, in intramural volleyball, I want to define the attack for you because it makes a difference, particularly in our co-rec games. Take a look at this uh, definition. You can see that an attack occurs when, uh, if at the moment of the player's contact, the ball is entirely higher than the top of the net, and such contact directs the ball towards the opponent. And this is, again, a big deal for front row attacks in particular. So uh, just because you're, not, you're standing on the ground does not mean that it cannot be an attack. You don't have to jump for it to be an attack. Here's the definition. The ball is entirely higher than the top of the net. So that's, in, again, entirely makes sense above that top edge of our net. And our net heights actually vary by league. We use a, a lower net height for women's play. We use a kind of an intermediate height for our co-rec leagues and our men's leagues are even higher height. And we have to change those for you before the game. So it'll be at the right height when you get out to play. Now, back row players may never attack the ball in front of the three-meter line. And you'll see this line at the diagram here of half of the court with the net here uh, at the top of the screen, but that's representing the middle of the court. The three-meter line, again, three meters or about 10 feet back from the net. And back row players, again, those are the folks who in the earlier diagram were positioned along the bottom or in the back of the rotation, may never attack the ball from in front of the three-meter line. Now, they can jump and attack the ball from behind this line, but they can't run up to the net and then do a spike, for example. Some other restrictions on back row players you should know of. Well, one, not a restriction. That is that back row players can attack the ball from behind the three-meter line, as I just mentioned. And both feet may be behind the line or actually must be behind the line prior to that takeoff. You can land across the line, but you have to take off from behind the line. Now, back row players may not participate in any sort of completed solo or collective block. So your front row players are going to be doing the blocking and most of the attacking, but there are some occasions where our back row players will uh, go for a spike or an attack, and they can do that from behind the three-meter line. That's absolutely OK. And again, land in front of the line. All right, let's talk about co-rec, because volleyball here at Intramural Sports, we have a lot of co-recs. We're going to talk about those rules just briefly, and one is our co-rec service rotation. You can see, it makes sense, it alternates between genders. So on our back row, female server, male, female, and then the front continues that rotation so that as you rotate your servers around, you'll have a different gender each time, male or female. So again, you'll alternate that in the service rotation. Now there's another key part to co-rec, and that is making sure that both genders touch the, the ball when you have contacts on your side. So let's take a look at the different ways in which in a co-rec game, your team can return the ball to the other side. We call those contacts or hits, and so we're going to use the word hit in this particular case. Now each team may get three hits per side to br bring it back over to the opponent, and that's standard for volleyball. Again, you usually get those three hits, and so if you can get it over in three hits, great. If it takes four, then that's a violation, the point goes to the other team. Makes sense. But here's how co-rec comes into play. If you're only using one hit, then a player of either gender can hit the ball. There are no restrictions to take it back over. So if there's a spike, for example, and I dig it over to the other side of the net and it goes right back over without anyone touching it, that's fine in a co-rec game because it just took one contact. Now, if we take two contacts, that's where we've got to get both genders involved. 
If we have two hits for our return, then a player of each gender must touch the ball or hit the ball before it is returned over the net. So you can see the legal combinations here, uh, yes, would be a male to a female. So on that exact example I gave earlier, if the contact comes over and I dig it up and we have a female touch the ball and send it over, that's okay. But if I dig the ball to another male player on my co-rec team and he sends it over, that would be a co-rec violation. And our officials will whistle that dead and award the point to the other team. So if you're going to use more than one contact, two, then you need to have one person of each gender touch the ball. If it's female, female, or male, male, that's no good. And the same principle applies here when we have three contacts. You should have an extra contact to make sure you get all the genders involved. You can see all the possibilities for yes. Again, they have both genders involved. If you have just three males touch it or three female contacts, then that is not allowed and that would be a co-rec violation. Oftentimes in our co-rec matches, you'll hear, per, for example, after the first two contacts were by a male, and all the team is working to make sure that the females know that they need to touch the ball and send it over. So they will communicate that if they're on the court to make it easier for your team. So you'll get used to this. It's certainly a little bit different, uh, but it involves everyone on the team. In our co-rec leagues, we have some competitive, but many of them are recreational. Out, folks having a good time out there, and we want, want to make sure that everyone is involved. David Peters with some rules changes to end our volleyball video and we'll first start with Co-Rec where in Division 1 now our male players have a little bit more freedom to play the game. You can attack the ball from anywhere but in Division 2 we have some restrictions on our male players and let's cover those right now. First of all in Division 2 for Co-Rec our male players may never attack the ball from in front of the three meter line. So even as a front row player as a male on the volleyball court you need to move behind the line and you can then make an attack here by jumping from behind the three meter line. Again that's male players in Division 2 for co -rec. Uh, female players, no restrictions, so you can certainly have an attack anywhere on the court. Now, for blocking in co-rec, again, any front row player may participate in a block, and there are no restrictions in our upper Division I level. But at Division II, male players may not break the plane of the net uh, when they're going after a block. And again, that is going up straight and not uh, going over to the other side as part of your block. Again, Division II, male players have this restriction, no restrictions on the ladies for blocking during co-rec. To finish up your registration, team captains you need to make sure that you take the team captain's exam, and you can do that online. It's available 24 hours a day up until the deadline. You can see the deadline for the volleyball exam, including the specific time that it's due, on our website at campusrec.fsu.edu. im If you have some changes to make to your registration, make sure that you do that with us before 5 o'clock on the final day of the registration period. You can certainly uh, do that via email through our website or in our office, which is located in 1035 Tally Gym. Hey, visit our website again, campusrec.fsu.edu, for the team captain's guide. That's where you'll get your regular season schedule, learn about the playoff draw meeting, and see the playoff brackets. It's all in one place. Plus, if you need more information about volleyball, you can read the complete intramural volleyball sport rules there at our website. And remember that all teams with the required sports group average, regardless of record, will advance to our playoffs. So at the end of your regular season, be sure to check for the playoff brackets so you can see when your opening round playoff game or match will be. For more information about intramural sports and intramural volleyball, give us a call during normal business hours in our office at 850-644-2430 or email us anytime from our website. That's new. It's at campusrec.fsu.edu. For intramural sports at Florida State University, I'm David Peters. Good luck and have fun this intramural volleyball season.